I'm Shivana Taj from the Wales TUC General Secretary. Um, and we felt that today was really important for us to be holding this event because as workers come to an end of an extremely difficult year, um, Wales TUC believes it's important for bosses to protect workers' mental health through measures such as decent wages, proper terms and conditions, training and support. Um, and we have um, today launching our toolkit, which is actually aimed at union reps and workers so that we can provide them with some better information, awareness and representation for workers experiencing mental health issues. We know that lots of people are going through a really difficult time with this um, right now. Um, we wanted to make sure that our reps um, understood um, uh, exactly how best to support those people as well, because it is is a really difficult one uh, to be dealing with and some of the cases that come up can be quite complex at times. So we'll jump right in then. Um, Elena Morgan is the Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing in Welsh Language. Uh, for those of you um, who are in the trade union movement and activists in the hospitality sector as well, um, some of you may have actually um, recently had um, quite a lot of interaction with Elena as well um, on matters in relation to keeping the hospitality sector uh, safe um, and going as well. So, uh, you know, Elena actually covers lots of different things as well as her official sort of job title as well. So thank you, Elena, and over to you. Thank you. Just the way to come out of here, I'm a go hard, yeah, don't mind real bless that if uh, I mean, I'll get a key and my inner blender was more hairy all you need to call and then Hannah's near my Hymri. Um, just to say thanks very much for the invitation um, to uh, be able to join you today. Um, it's been probably one of the most challenging work years in the history of of the Welsh Parliament. You know, it's been going for 22 years, but nobody's ever had anything like this. And you know, we keep on using that word unprecedented, but it truly is unprecedented. Um, and the scale of the issues that are faced by the public sector and the private sector are just immense. Um, so just in terms of, you know, the, the latest situation we're in, it is a really, really serious and critical situation. Uh, and, you know, we need people to take this really seriously. Um, and, and, you know, it's great that there's a vaccine uh, on the horizon, uh, but we've got a long way to go before uh, things settle and that, that we get that kind of herd immunity as a result of the vaccine. Um, just to say that the First Minister, I'm delighted to say, has appointed me as the First Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing. Um, and the point of that is to recognise the importance of mental health and to give this the increased uh, government focus that it needs. And it's clear now that as we enter the winter, um, supporting people's mental health is likely to become of increasing importance, um, especially as the challenges of COVID are being persistent, they're not going away, and they are, uh, it does look like they're going to be increasingly more difficult in the new year. And of course, on top of that, we've got the threat of job losses um, as a result of Brexit. And the one thing that we know absolutely clearly is there is a direct correlation between mental health and the kind of insecurity of, of, of job losses. So we know that that, that that tension is likely to increase. And, and really, I think you have to be made of stone if you haven't had some kind of, um, of stressful time this year. And stress can then uh, lead into mental health issues and uh, and I think one of the things that um, I'm very clear about is that we've got to understand that mental health is not just a, men uh, a medical issue. There are loads and loads of different things that can lead to mental health issues. And there's a danger that we medicalize, we over medicalize uh, mental health issues. So there's lots and lots of circumstances that can lead to mental health issues. You can have problems in terms of family breakup or financial or debt issues, or you can have a difficult upbringing, or you could, you could find it difficult to, to come to terms with the sexuality or whatever it is, it is all of those things can contribute, but it's not necessarily a medical issue that has to be addressed. It's about giving people the tools to cope with a difficult and stressful situation. And that's why I think that the TUC put in the focus on this, understanding that this is an area that absolutely merits uh, some attention is, is absolutely right. And I 
very much welcome the fact that you have developed this toolkit um, because I, we've got to recognize the cost of not engaging with mental health. So there has been um, some research done that suggests that the Welsh economy loses about 17 billion pounds a year as a result of not addressing the issue of mental health. And uh, just to make it clear that uh, the Welsh Government, this is not something new for the Welsh Government, um, we've got a very clear strategy on this together for mental health, um, which is a cross-government approach to tackling this issue. But we spend more on mental health than any other part of the government. So we spend about £700 million a year on mental health, that's before COVID, um, in order to, to recognise that this is a, a very serious uh, issue that we have to address. Um, it's suggested that one in six children now uh, have issues with mental health, so that's certainly something we need to focus on in terms of the longer term challenges. And 80% of mental health issues, it's suggested, are started as in childhood or in young people. So, you know, it's really important that we focus our attention on those areas to make sure that the problem doesn't arise if possible. And um, I think it's really great that the TUC and your leadership now uh, in focusing on this in the workplace uh, really gets the profile it deserves. And certainly this is something we welcome as the Welsh Government. Uh, and you'll know that this is a part of the economic contract that we asked we ask employers to take this seriously to really put a focus on this and it's in everybody's mutual interest to make sure that we have a healthy mental health uh, aspect in the workplace one of the i mean there's so few things that, that are positive that's come out, come out of the uh, the pandemic but one of the things i think that has happened is that the stigma of talking about mental health is, is being eroded because you know there's there's nobody who hasn't suffered in terms of mental health during this crisis everybody understands the issue of mental health now because of the stresses and the the instability and insecurity and you know especially at the beginning none of us knew what we were heading into uh, none of us had any idea and there's no question about it that that raised the stress levels uh, amongst the population generally um, and so we do have to recognize that this trauma this this society trauma that has happened is not going to go away overnight uh, and this is something that we absolutely need to um, to to focus on because um, the consequences of this uh, will be with us for for a long time so uh, I think this is absolutely central to what trade unions should be doing um, and I absolutely recognize that the toolkit uh, is is absolutely key to giving people the tools within the trade union movement to to use to be able to focus on to learn about um, different aspects of this you know because it's very it's different it's different for every single individual and that's something that, that we need to understand as well it's different if you're young it's different if you're older it's different if you're black and asian or, or an ethnic minority and and all of those issues you know we need to think about the cultural challenges you know the fact is that you know we we provide a huge amount of support for people but some people don't go and pick it up so we've got to remember that we need to think in a different way about addressing those kind of communities so you know we've got specific programs for example to reach into black and ethnic communities just to make sure that they that, that we can we can that they're aware of the the services that are available to them so um just to say that we're absolutely behind you 100 percent on this and uh, it will be it's really great to see that you're focusing on this and if there's anything we can do as a government to support you in, in rolling this out then we will yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elena. That was uh, that was brilliant. I mean, it is pretty scary, particularly the 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 statistic that you refer to in terms of children, the one in six children um, will, you know, have an issue with mental health and that 80 percent of, you know, mental health issues um, often start in childhood. I mean, and then you take into account the pandemic and where we are and the fact that parents are also facing so many complex, different issues within their lives. Um, that affect them, whether it's a, a personal issue in terms of home life issues 
or whether it's a work issue. And when you pull all of those factors together, it is a very complex matter. And um, it would be quite interesting to, to see um, when it comes to support for families in particular, what sort of additional wraparound support can be provided for families that may have um, a sort of um, multi, um, uh, mul you know, a multiple of needs. Um, so, so I think in the, in the future, that would be uh, quite an interesting one uh, to, to maybe uh, understand. Um, again, the, you know, the, as far as the economic contract is concerned, um, and the fact that the, this specific issue is going to be highlighted within that, um, and we're asking employers to focus on these issues and to support people, more the reason why our toolkit is going to be useful. Um, in terms of um, the toolkit, it would be brilliant for um, the employer side uh, to um, acknowledge and accept our toolkit in the same way as did the mental or the menopause toolkit as well, and for that to be rolled out across the both the public sector um, and the private sector. Because the last thing that we want is for lots of people to feel that they have to recreate something that's it's already there. We would rather people use the toolkit and if there's something missing we work collaboratively to add that additional element in. So um, that takes me, uh, we will take a, a series of questions so you know people um, who are listening in uh, do keep uh, posting in um, and that nicely leads us to Rhianna Williams, our TUC, uh, Wales TUC Equality Policy Officer um, who will um, go through the, the toolkit now with us and she's going to be sharing it on her screen. And so hopefully you'll see that now. Over to you, Rhianna. Thank you very much. Um, let me just reduce the other screens. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the, um, the toolkit um, and you'll be able to access that online on our website. Um, you'll also be sent a link immediately after um, this event so that you can download it and hopefully digest it. Um, I've picked up things that have come up in the toolkit so everything that I talk um, about here today will be in the toolkit so you can refer to it at your leisure. So the things I'm going to talk about just quickly are um, mental health in the workplace, why it's a trade union issue, um, how mental health is not the same for everyone, how we talk about it at work and what we can do to make um, mental health better at work. Um, so starting off with that, um, you know, that, that comment that work can be good for our mental health. Um, but only when it's good work. Um, you know, we've got a massive amount of information in the toolkit, but hopefully, you know, this is the um, the message that you'll leave here with today. Um, whatever we can do to make um, mental health uh, a bigger issue in the workplace can only be beneficial. Um, so moving on to the workplace as a community. So work is a really important part of human life. It's a source of income for us, but it's also so much more. You know, it's a community. It's where we offer people um, somewhere to contribute, where we set ourselves targets, um, where we can reach our full potential and where we can develop and maintain really valuable social networks you know for those of us who work from home some of us may feel that we're not accessing those social networks like we usually do um, for others you know they get social interaction online and it's much more accessible now um, but for people with mental health challenges we can provide um, really good links to the wider community meeting people that you wouldn't normally come into contact with it can also provide support through employee assistance schemes you know access to your trade union as well as stability friendship and financial assistance so work can be one of the most important factors for mental health and positive promotion of mental health in the workplace can lead to increased satisfaction efficiency productivity at work so benefits there for the employer as well as for the worker and it can contribute to your personal and professional development but on the other side work-related stress bullying and poor consideration for workers mental health really negatively impacts the whole entire workforce and it can cause absenteeism high staff turnover a culture of presenteeism so when you turn up but you're not really there and a loss of productivity amongst workers um, so it can be good for our, our mental health but only when it's good work so what is good work um, and we've kind of taken a long time to, to, to discuss this through our fair work agenda 
um, you know, and, and work for a lot of people will mean decent pay, but it's also the ability to make changes, it's favourable terms and conditions, proper adherence to um, health and safety legislation, it's having a voice um, and respect within the workplace. You know, bosses realising that they've got a duty of care to workers and equal treatment for workers. So why are we talking about mental health as a trade union issue? Well, you know, this has been long a, a trade union issue and we've been as unions at the forefront of a campaign for equality and fair treatment for work at work from the beginning. Mental health is an absolutely key part of that work. We've all got mental health and unions are really effective at working with employers to make changes in the workplace that can impact us positively. So that could be through collective bargaining or as reasonable adjustments um, on an individual basis. But our approach is to reduce the barriers that disadvantage working people um, that, who have mental health issues. So this means that we do some of the following. We help create a culture where mental health and well-being is openly discussed without judgment or stigma. We scrutinise employment practices um, to help fight discrimination and to reduce barriers to make workplaces more mentally health friendly, mental health friendly, sorry. Um, we provide support to workers, we, make, we help make adjustments to suit them and their needs and we tackle and challenge the stigma around mental health, wherever it may arise. Um, we're also there to provide advice and guidance. This can in include signposting and if you are going to download our new toolkit, there is um, lots of um, signposting links there. So if you do need further support from a, a mental health professional, you can always go to those um, professionals. Um, and we can signpost to you know, national organisations or local organisations. Um, we monitor and review the workplace actions on mental health and we represent workers on workplace issues. So we negotiate appropriate workplace policies and procedures as well as individual um, adjustments. Um, it's not the same for everyone. I think this year has shown that more than every, and ever before. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic has forced many to consider how seriously their employer values their health and safety. So many workers have felt that their employer is not adhering to guidance, asking them to come into the workplace when they could easily stay at home and work, or not providing appropriate equipment or PPE to help keep workers healthy. Some workers have resigned or retired due to the crisis, you know, which impacts on your finances and your well-being. Many others have lost their jobs or suffered financially through reduced incomes, like furlough. So workers are amongst the many groups who will feel the health and societal effects of this crisis well into the future. Many people feel that they've got no choice other than to go to work to earn money or secure more work in the future. You know, and this also relates really strongly to who you are and what kind of job you do. So those who are employed on precarious contracts may have chosen to go to work despite not feeling safe because it's the only way that they can access workplace benefits. Um, and these benefits should be universal. Things like sickness pay, holiday pay, redundancy pay, um, or even the national minimum wage, which is universal, but it's not. there are loopholes in which employers have tried to get away with not paying people what they should earn. In our research, we found that black women are more likely to be on zero hour contract jobs, and that's put them at particular risk during the pandemic, forcing them to make choices about whether they earn money or whether they put themselves into an unsafe working environment. Lower wage workers are also more likely to suffer disproportionately and women make up the largest part of NHS staff. So key workers have been particularly at risk during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, adding to the fear that we all share that contracting the virus, you know, there are significant um, changes to our daily lives. Our movements are restricted and we've got new realities, you know, blended learning, working from home, um, furlough, um, unemployment, being around your kids all the time, you know, lack of physical contact with our other family members, friends, colleagues. And it becomes really, you know, clear why this has been a year of collective trauma, with some particularly facing very difficult times. 
So how do we talk about mental health at work? Um, we've got some talking tips which are in the toolkit, um, you know, and, and mental health can affect any one of us at any time in our life. Mental health does not discriminate. And so there should be no stigma attached to it. Um, and so, you know, there are tips here and I really implore you to look at them because you will probably find yourself, you know, using them at some point in your life. Um, we worked with Platform, a mental health charity to develop this toolkit. And the main issues that they raised with us, which I think are really important here, is to try and drop the diagnosis. So don't try and diagnose someone. You know, we are not trained to do this kind of work. Um, and, you know, it will take a, me a medical professional to do that work. You know, we are here to support people. We don't need their diagnosis. We don't need to guess how someone's feeling um, or suggest solutions to their problems. We just need to give people time and space and we need to listen to them and don't put pressure on people to make changes that they're not ready to make, but support them when they are. So if someone does want your support, um, it's also important to know that legally you don't have to give detailed medical notes to access this support. The Equality Act um, from 2010 um, will be very relevant if mental ill health significantly affects a person's day-to-day -day life. Um, and that doesn't mean every day. It could mean once or twice a month. And if it lasts for more than 12 months, you meet the legal criteria. Um, so employers can provide support without a diagnosis and they can put in reasonable adjustments without knowing the name of the syndrome or condition and workers can access help. So it's worth knowing that the Equality Act protects you for life because it recognises that there is a stigma, however much we try and overcome it, that mental health can carry. Um, so example, for example, if you had um, mental health issues in your 20s, but are finding that um, getting a job is difficult um, because of mental health issues, even long after you've recovered, then you can access help and support legally. Um, so, you know, top tips for changing a workplace culture, um, things like changing policies, providing training for managers and workers and providing that supportive environment is going to be really, really important. Um, but always remember that there is a community that supports you. So, you know, services like um, can work with um, workplaces. Um, when we did the menopause campaign, we had really good examples of how well this could work with occupational therapy, um, occupational support. Um, working directly with GP's office to provide a direct route for referral on the menopause, you know, and, and trade unions can be really innovative with this work and help um, provide better links between community led services and workplaces. And, you know, just to end, to promote and enable people to be active and engaged in their own well being, but without pressure is really important too. Um, so my contact details and the contact details of the Wales CUC are here um, and I am welcome to, you're welcome to take, I'm happy to take questions now or later whenever is up, up to the chair. Thank you very much. Thanks Rhiannis. Um, if people can keep posting up the questions and then we can uh, probably take them in the end. Um, but I think that there's a couple of points that really stuck out in your presentation to me. And that was uh, that the Equality Act protects you for life, um, that mental health uh, does not discriminate and that we should drop the diagnosis. And this actually goes back to the points that um, the minister was making in relation to we shouldn't be medicalizing this issue either. Um, and th that there isn't this one size fits all approach. So we do have to make sure that there's some flexibilities um, within uh, the support that's being offered. So. Um, before we go to the questions um, at the end, we have uh, a bit of a treat for you uh, because we've got a panel um, discussion um, next that's going to be led by Julie Cook, um, our Wales, one of our Wales TUC national officers, who is going to be joined by Sue Carlick, who's a Wales TUC tutor, Carmen Bezina, who is the UNICEF mental health lead um, officer, and Maxine Butler, a GMB union rep. So they all this is going to be quite a good little session and I'm well looking forward to it. So um, over to you, Julie. Thanks, Shav. Um, yeah, a big welcome to Maxine, Sue and Carmen. Absolutely delighted that you were able to come here and help us launch 
this really important uh, mental health toolkit today. And we look forward to hearing about your experiences regarding mental health and your perspective. So we've got experiences here on the panel. Uh, we've got a trade union officer, we've got a trade union activist, and we've got someone who's going to talk about her personal experience. So shall we start by asking you, Maxine, um, if you could talk to me about your experience as a union activist uh, around the mental health issues that you've come across. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm a branch secretary for a local authority in North Wales. And as you can imagine, at the moment, it's an added layer with COVID, uh, people feeling very isolated. I've had members that get quite stressed and haven't got that um, support from colleagues at the moment because they're mostly working from home dealing with their mental health and things getting even more out of perspective when it comes to going through processes formally rather for managing sickness managing um, disciplinaries and general day-to-day -day worries because they're sitting at home and I've had an experience where I've sat with a member um, who was who rang me at six o'clock in the morning threatening um, to take his own life and that was quite a hard um, experience to go through but it's being there for people to actually come and see me and, and see me as a I'm a neutral person I'm not going to make any judgment and listen and listening is a big part of helping people with their mental health Thank you, Maxine. I think, you know, that is an issue, isn't it? You know, we've got so many people working from home and for some people it works really well, but for others there is that isolation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we really do need to recognise that employers need to recognise how they're going to and think about how they're going to support people working from home better. So thank you for sharing that with us, Maxine. Um, so, what about your personal experience, Sue? Perhaps you could, would like to tell us your story. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, within my experience, my, my home background, in uh, manufacturing is where I come from. Um, I worked in manufacturing for uh, this the UK for over 30 years and um, never thought I'd have um, uh, mental health problems and, and um, going on. Uh, but in 2006, it all started. Um, and then uh, from there on, uh, when I was made redundant, um, my routine and structure changed. Because when you think of your own uh, personal um, um, work, then it's always routine and structure. That routine and structure changed my whole life and it still does today. Uh, so from 2006, when I got made redundant, um, those, those days were difficult. But then um, with the help that I had then, um, um, obviously from my family and uh, you know um, I had the help that I needed then from my GP to uh, uh, keep going there more than anything you know but um, uh, today uh, it is it can have its ups and downs because as a, as a tutor as a, as a, you know when I, get, I work with you guys as well and had a learning wheels um, I, I got no routine or structure but that's fine I can I can uh, live with that that's no problem you just adapt to those changes around you um and uh, you know um, you know we we'll go and get uh, work elsewhere as well which i do um and then in 2000 uh when was it i can't remember the years that was just gone up to my mind now at the moment i did get a job in mind in party pool uh, as an admin support and then started working with training in mind as most i don't know whether most of them know um um you know uh, setting up a mental health first aid wales maybe quite a lot of them have done the mental health first aid wales courses and, um, and uh, I enjoyed everything about it. Uh, and again, I did have good days and have bad days, and I did have that support within training in mind. Uh, but unfortunately, there was one colleague there, um, and which did have a big impact on my life as well, um, through bullying. But again, um, I got through that, and I had the help of my uh, trade union along that side as well. And um, in 2016, unfortunately, I got made redundant sad day again but it's like those peaks and troughs all the time isn't it you know so uh, uh like now today everything's you know does be different for me as well uh maybe a lot older and i said i sometimes think of it a little bit wiser as well but uh 
you know, we all have those good days and bad days, you know. But um, uh, I still teach um, uh, with the trade union um, and within the community, so I like to think that I support um, um, our reps out there within uh, the um, uh, trade union uh, uh, duties as well. I teach quite a lot of the mental health um, um, courses online, uh, which, as I said, you know, it's all changed now today, isn't it? You know, online training. Um, and that was a large impact, is uh, basically um, um, getting on to teach the um, mental health first aid courses on there. But I got, I got there and with, a, you know, um, with the help of uh, quite a lot of the, the trade union tutors and obviously Vanessa out there, she's there somewhere in, in there. And uh, she's there to support me with all the tech. But again, you know, um, again, uh, you know, you have your peaks and troughs and like going through COVID as, as uh, uh, Rihanna mentioned, like, you know, um, um, it can be difficult for people. And again, I do get anxiety, I don't, I don't know, don't get me wrong, but uh, again, you've got to try and live, you know, try to get on with things as well and look after your well-being and making sure that, uh, you know, you uh, go out there and uh, look after your well-being. So whether it's taking the dog for a walk or whatever the case may be, doing right keep, which I like my right keep, but yeah, so thanks. Thank you so much, Sue. That's um, you no know, special thanks, actually, for um, you coming along to share that. It, I, it can't have been easy for you to do that, but such a valuable contribution, I think, um, today. And um, so, I'd like to, you know, personally thank you for that. You know, and I know you, I've known you a while, and I know that you've gone through your struggles. But, you know, you're talking now about, you know, you're, you've moved on to um, doing some training around mental health online. Yeah. And it just be, I'm just interested to know, um, has the uh, demand, do you think, or have you seen the demand then in the need for mental health training um, well, during this year in particular? Yeah, um, well, unfortunately, and I'm going to say unfortunately, we've only had a few people uh, on there. And I think it's a, um, it's a different way of teaching as well, because I don't, I don't know whether, there's, you know, some people uh, like to work online. It's just having that face-to-face uh, um, -face contact then, is there, you know, when you you've got your classroom-based as well, you know, and uh, quite a lot of people like that classroom-based. But you know, the ones that we have done has been very, very positive, you know, so... Uh, um, yeah, so it has worked well, but again, you know, it's, um, it's, yeah, so it's just getting it out there really and for people to adapt to those type of changes as well, because um, COVID is not going to get a work, go away today uh, or tomorrow. It's going to you know, be a, um, a, a long struggle at the moment, you know, even though we cannot, uh, you know, they got the vaccine there, it's not going to go away tomorrow. So again, it's just changing the way that we teach now um, online at the moment. But uh, um, I'm getting used to it now, so uh, um, yeah, and yeah, so I'm enjoying it. Yeah, good. Thank you so much, Sue. No um, and um, and on to uh, Carmen. Now you're obviously a union officer, Carmen, and um, perhaps you could tell us about your experiences in perhaps uh, having to, um, you know. Uh, negotiate maybe in workplaces or represent people perhaps you could tell us a little about a bit about um, what you're doing around mental health okay Th thanks Julian and thanks for inviting me today it's so I was so pleased to hear of the the toolkit that you've produced and the importance of, of mental health um, I'll just talk a little bit before the work that I'm doing as a mental health lead in Wales for Unison um, because we're either actually going through a mental health condition problem we've been through one or we know you know we know close family or friends or colleagues that are, that are going through um, mental health problems or conditions um so back in 2000 i lost a loved one through suicide and back nearly 20 years ago now it was a completely different uh, scenario situation to, to what we we you know we, we've got as regards to support um and it completely crashed my world um the stigma was absolutely huge um and basically i had to rebuild my life from scratch um and i wanted some kind of positivity to come out of such a negative situation so i worked with uh, welsh government 
and my previous employer, which was PCS Union. Um, and we gained some funding and uh, I set up a support group in South Wales for people who were being bereaved uh, by suicide. Um, and that went from strength to strength. The group is still meeting now. Um, my goal, my achievement was met. So it was time for new people to come on board um, to, to take ownership of that. Um, so I would say for the last sort of six, seven years, I've been the mental health lead in, in Wales. Um, and I'm also, I also have responsibility for disabled members. And what I was finding in the region is the amount of case audits that were coming through, uh, high levels of sickness, stress, bullying, bullying cases that escalated into a mental health uh, problem. Um, so we decided then as the disabled members group to um, do an audit of our branches, which covers local government, health, private sector uh, and the community sector. And we gathered the evidence because we needed that evidence to take take forward. I knew it was huge in Wales, but we, we needed that to capture the, the information. So once we had that information, we were able to, to sit down uh, as a group, as the disabled members, and look at an action plan. And the one thing that we, we did to begin with six years ago was to roll out mental health awareness. Um, so we did a, a launch in, in Swansea that was um, very successful. Um, obviously new members coming on board because obviously they were impacted um, by their own mental health. Um, and then we progressed it then from mental health awareness um, to a mental health champions uh, role within Wales. Um, so that went from, from strength to strength. I know, Sue, you were involved in the work that we did with our Wales disabled members. Um, and it grew from strength to strength. And those mental health champions are in the workplace, helping and supporting and signposting members um, or, or any member of staff uh, to the relevant services. Um, we've also ha held a, a mental health conference where the, uh, our health minister, uh, Vaughan Gethin, attended along with our, our general secretary. And it really did highlight um, across, you know, certainly across the whole of the union, the importance and about talking about mental health. Um, and it was about smashing down those barriers um, about talking about, about issues. Um, so where we are right now is that we're looking to roll out the Mental Health Champions Project nationally across the union and also the disabled members put a motion to um, national conference that was taken to Welsh Labour as well um, and that we, what was desperately needed in Wales was a mental health minister and I'm really delighted that we now have, have one in Wales. Um, there's still so much work to do it's you know I, I won't talk a little bit I won't talk too much about what's going on with Covid but we are only just seeing the ripple effect and come 2021-2022 you know I see frontline workers who are absolutely exhausted um, they're scarred because of the, the the equipment that they're wearing they're going home they're not being able to be with loved ones because they're worried about you know catching covid and they're just on automatic pilot right now and next year we're going to see a rise in mental health problems and if we don't tackle it if we don't deal with that they could escalate into to further mental health uh, conditions so that's a little bit about the work that i've been doing and in in unison and it's great to be on board um with the wales 2c Thanks so much, Carmen, and congratulations on the success of mental health uh, champions uh, role that you've um, developed and the way that you've done that, I think is excellent. And I really like the idea of, of having someone championing the, mm -hmm. the issue at work. And it'd be great if we could kind of spread and share that with other unions too, that may want to Absolutely. kind of all that because you know it is it's absolutely vital isn't it so it is. thank you for sharing that um carmen and yeah congratulations on that that's a great great uh, move forward there um i'm going to move on i'm conscious that we've got about mm, 10 minutes and i think we need uh, a bit of time shaft don't we for some questions at the end so i think what i'm going to do is is um, I'm going to ask the panellists 
um, if you could just say something about how we can make things better for workers. Um, and if there's anything else that you want to add quite quickly, then this is your opportunity to add anything that you've missed out so far. So who, who'd like to start? Carmen, would you, as you're on at the moment, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, my... What, how can we make things better for people at work? At work. I think... Um... One of the most important things, and I think we're all, you know, Elin had mentioned it earlier, you know, we've all been impacted, you know, just this year alone by COVID and the impact that it's having on our, our work and our, our home life. Um, so I think the most important thing is to listen, but to active listen as well and not be judgmental because, sorry if you can hear my daughter in the background, um, it's, it's really important that we, we take the time out just to listen. It's not our jobs to diagnose. Um, there's professional help out there, either going through the GP or through the, the community uh, services that, that are available. Um, so, and, and the other thing as well is arranging some local events, you know, have a, a coffee and a chat. You know, we're in a, a, a challenging time where people are not seeing people in the workplace. We're doing everything virtually. Um, arrange a coffee and a catch up uh, virtually and just, you know, how are you doing? Let's have a cake or a coffee. Uh, and it's, it's just it's just those simple things can mean so much to people. Um, from from my personal experience, but the other thing as well is that we need to be highlighting the the issues around mental health to organisations, to employers, and it's about partnership working. It's about us helping um, our obviously our members, um, but it's about how we can work collaboratively together to to help people um, who are experiencing mental health problems. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Maxine, do you want to come yeah. in? And what we've got in um, my local authority in Rexton is we've had about, we've got a group of 40 of us mixed of um, union reps, managers, have done the mental health first aid training and we're now um, mental health champions and all our contact details are available on our internet for any staff member to get in touch with us and have a confidential conversation. And that really works for the staff and for us because we've got a buddy now that we can offload on because it could be quite lonely being a mental health champion and um, you've got no one to treat it, everything confidential you've got no one to offload on but that really works and i'd recommend that and this toolkit will now help with that mental health group that we meet regularly Thanks, Maxine. And I think, um, you know, one of the other, when we first started working on mental health at the Wales TUC, and we're talking some years ago now, you know, one of the, um, the major things that kept coming up all the time was, you know, well, unions in the Wales TUC are providing training for reps around mental health, but very little in terms of managers being trained. And so, you know, and so about when we come to talk about collaborative working, it's quite hard when you've got unions being trained on this stuff, and yet the manager management are just not getting either they're not doing it for choice or they're not they're not provided with it. You know, do, do would you agree that that's the case where in your experience where you know managers are just not getting proper training? Yeah, the, the way it works with us, I had a manager come to me to say one of her um, team was suffering with um, domestic violence and she didn't know where to go. So then we got, using the Wolf funding, we then got a group of managers together and they see the value in it now. So now it's like a ripple effect and it's going through the whole organisation where everyone wants to get on board because yeah. they don't know where to signpost, they don't know how to handle it. So... Yes, this collaborative yeah. work is working really well in Wrexham at the minute. Good, good to hear. Okay, and finally, Sue, um, how, how, what can we do that, that makes things better for workers from your perspective? I think uh, like uh, yeah, engaging a lot more um, when this, um, like, um, uh, I think uh, Carmen and uh, uh, Maxine have said, like, you know, it's um, 
is trying to uh, catch up maybe with teams, um, like as um, Carmen said, about uh, uh, coffee and cake online or whatever the case may be, but again, with um, engaging with uh, people um, within the workplace as well. It's just uh, just trying to make that work because it can be very difficult at the present moment with the uh, online because, um, you know, you can't uh, really tell um, uh, how someone is feeling online. That makes sense, you know. So again, you know, if you can uh, link in with um, uh, your colleagues uh, on a like maybe a monthly basis or weekly basis, whatever the case may be, you know. So like with myself, you know, like I try to uh, get hold of uh, like um, some of the uh, tutors uh, to uh, get online and have a chat, see how their mental health is, you know. So uh, but it's engaged, it's trying to engage more uh, with it within that then really. So uh, I don't know whether I answered that. Um, Okay, if you're ready. Perfect. Thank you, Sue. And uh, thank you to um, obviously uh, Carmen and Maxine as well for um, a really interesting panel session, I think. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. So I'm going to hand back to you now, Shav, if there's any questions. There are loads of questions. Thank you to the panel. That was really good. Um, I'm conscious of time. We'll just to let people know we'll run no later than 1:35, so we've got about 10 minutes. Um, I understand that some of the panel members may need to leave, but um, there was a, a question, um, and I don't know, maybe Vianna might be able to answer this one. So the first question was from Marcus Bedwell, um, and it says, "Any information on the financial well-being agenda and its links to our mental health would be useful, please." Um, yeah, well, we've got some self-care tips in the um, new toolkit that look at um, financial well-being as part of the self-care agenda. Um, but we've been actively working with the Money and Pensions Advice Service um, on bringing this um, agenda into the, uh, the, the mental health toolkit. You know, this is a living document and we're planning on updating it all of the, all the time. Um, and so financial wellbeing, you know, is self-care, um, knowing your budget, understanding, um, you know, being mindful of your spending, managing your debts responsibly are all things that can actively support um, your mental health. Um, and so we will continue working with the Money and Pensions Advice Service and hopefully bring you some um, updated information as we continue to populate this document. Um, but we've got some information on the website um, and in this toolkit there are some tips there as well. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ree. Um, and while you're there, actually, the, the next question was from Sean Gale. Um, who says that Rihanna mentioned that as part of the Equality Act 2010, you don't have to have a diagnosis of mental health. Can you elaborate on this? Um, uh, sort of what proof do you then require, e.g., a letter from a doctor? Thanks. Um, so, this letter from a doctor um, is something that employers will probably ask you for. Um, and we live in a system which is quite medically model based. Um, as trade unions, we support the, so the social model of disability. So in the social model, your disability are the barriers that stop you being or feeling equal. Um, so for example, in, in with mental health, the, um, the barriers are other people's perceptions or your inability to access reasonable adjustments. The, um, the legislation was aimed to be written in a very social model um, perspective. So um, you don't need, all you need to um, meet the legal criteria of disability, which is what you would be covered under if you were looking to, for protection on behalf of mental health, is for um, um, your mental health to um, significantly impact your day-to-day -day life. And that doesn't mean day-to-day, -day, that could be once or twice a month, um, but on a regular basis. And for it to have lasted or be expected to last more than 12 months. Um, so if it meets those two criteria, then you don't have to give um, medical documents um, to support that. Now, for some people, they may choose to give medical documents documents because it's sometimes easier sometimes employers haven't got their heads around you know providing you know this this kind of level of support without um, medical documents 
Um, and you know, for some people know that um, it may speed things up a little bit, but it's not something you have to do. Um, and as part of this campaign, that's the kind of culture that we're hoping to change. Um, you know, you can access support, your reasonable adjustments um, should be things that, you know, help you to work better. Um, and, you know, they could be things um, like, you know, come into work at a different time if you still go into the physical workplace. Um, because, you know, to avoid the traffic, um, if, you know, standing in, sitting in traffic is, is a trigger for you. Or, you know, if you have um, mental health issues because of your care and responsibilities, having that discussion with your employer about how to meet your responsibilities um, alongside, you know, supporting your own mental health, it doesn't have to be medical. Um, you know, we're talking about the barriers that stop you feeling um, as well as you possibly can do. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've long supported the social model and, um, yeah, there's more information in the toolkit. Brilliant, thank you, thank you, Rihanna. Um, and I have another question that I'm gonna to feel to Maxine. Um, what do you uh, feel is the way forward for trade unions and organizations to support their own reps and officers when dealing with difficult situations with their members? And I, and I thought this would be a good one for you because Maxine, you specifically at the start, um, mentioned that you were dealing with a lot of personal cases, quite often complex, and that actually the last night you had this difficult call from, you know, somebody who said that they were considering, you know, possibly taking their own life. And I know that this is something um, even for, uh, we heard recently from taxi drivers who had said that, you know, they had set up a WhatsApp group. Uh, specifically almost like a, um, a, a, a sort of a suicide watch literally is what they refer to it as so yeah if you want I don't know whether you want to sort of say a bit more in terms of what help you think unions could even be given yourself to deal with these types of complex things because it affects you too it does um, I, my union is really good I've got a really good regional officer that I can contact and we talk things through and it's also having the union being able to offer you um, appropriate training is always helpful for, for reps. We've also got a WhatsApp group where we, um, other reps in the area, can we all keep in contact with each other and offer that shoulder really to the ear to listen to. And it is just keeping that open mind and keeping the communication going to, so then you can then offload on what's worrying you. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, and then uh, we have another question from uh, Richard Spite, I think is how you say it. Um, given the economic impact, will the TUC be supporting campaigns such as CBT for Wales that aim to increase access to talking therapies across Wales, especially by investing significant amounts in training accredited CBT practitioners in all parts of Wales? Um, uh, Julie, I don't know whether you want to say anything on that one. Yeah, I think um, I think it um, it kind of relates a little bit to uh, unless I've got the question wrong, but um, what I was saying about earlier in terms of uh, the kind of training that is um, available for um, employers to use, so that you know we've got like an equal footing really because we are doing more than our fair share of making sure that unions understand these issues. But you know there is there is a massive problem. There's a massive problem where you know we have employers that are just either ignoring this horrendous problem or sweeping it under the carpet and just not providing the right support for. Because I mean, for managers as well. If I you know I'm a manager myself, and you know if I didn't have like proper training and awareness, and I had members of my team that were suffering with mental health issues how am i supposed to help those individuals and, and groups of people that i'm supposed to manage i think it's absolutely essential absolutely essential that you know we push for this yeah. i we pushed for this back years ago and got very not really got very far with it at all i don't know if that answers your question I think I think that does, and that takes us nicely to to the next question that I'm going to feel to Carmen because she has posted something up that she may want to refer to in this as well. So the question is from Ryan Gray, 
Um, the question is, what steps and resources are being created um, slash used to, create, to encourage organizations to support employees into better work? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so there's there's lots of different activities and support that employers can do for for staff. Um, most people will be aware that we have a time to talk day, uh, which is normally around February time. We have mental health awareness week, uh, whereby employers can engage with their staff um, to talk about mental health. And now more than ever is is it's absolutely vital. And there's World Mental Health Day as well that takes place in, in October. But I would ask everybody that attends uh, today's uh, webinar is to, to actually go back to your employer and explore whether they've uh, signed up to a Time to Change Wales uh, pledge, where that is an action plan that's um, worked with MIND and also with the employer on steps that they're going to do to help and support staff. Um, and also looking at working within, you know, some policies and your trade union should be able to, to support and help you uh, around that. So hopefully that's answered your uh, question, Ryan. Brilliant. Um, okay, it's 1.35. Um, we had a, a final uh, question and I don't know if um, someone from the panel um, or maybe a few of you just want to say something really quickly. Um, so the question, the final question is from Stephen Austin, um, which says, uh, do you think the crisis which has hit people in many professions who as a result of what has um, been needed of them um, and then having mental health issues, e.g. being made an essential worker and having to go into work and when they don't want to um, result in the movement of people, um, you know, where they end up having to change jobs or to areas where they're not likely to be essential or to work in a group setting and not at home. So um, I guess, you know, the, the pandemic has hit people in lots of different ways. At the start, if you remember, um, you know, there were some individuals who, who could be um, uh, classified and therefore didn't have to physically go into work because they were classed as shielding. There were some people as well who, um, you know, uh, were able to get classed as, as being able to shield for mental health um, uh, reasons as well. But of course, do you think that some people have ended up in a position where they, it's just too much pressure? And because of the fact that they were initially classed as essential, that they've switched over. And I don't know whether um, Maxine or Carmen, I, I don't know if uh, Susan is still on uh, the, the call. I can't see her, her name um, still there, but I was just wondering whether you know, you've seen this um, or experienced it as, as officers and reps. I, if I could just come in uh, quickly, because I'm going to have to, to go soon, but um, it's a really good question, Stephen, because I think every profession has been um, hit with this uh, crisis, this continuous crisis. Um, and, you know, being made an essential worker, you know, that is only going to, from my experience with working uh, with, with members, is that it, it actually intensifies the anxiety, um, especially, you know, in, I'll just mention just social care, for example, you know, going into to residential or even to people's homes, not having the adequate PPE. And that's been one of the major factors uh, that I know that the TUC have done a lot of work um, on that. Um, and that'll just, you know, um, you know, it, it will just create more anxiety and, and, and issues. But I think every profession, um, people uh, are working from home. Um, people, you know, are wanting to be, to go into the workplace. Um, so that there's lots of issues, but what I'd say to anyone, if you're not in a union, join a union, because that is the way to collective, collectively get people on board to actively speak to their employer about the issues around mental health and in particular with what's going on with, with COVID. Brilliant. Perfect message there. Maxine? I, I agree with Carmen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Collective bargaining is the power is having the, the membership. And it is difficult when it's, I, I'm in a class as an essential worker, as a social worker. You know, it's just managing it and having managers on board to manage it and recognizing that mental health, it, it's to be reassigned. I've had members have to be reassigned because their mental health hasn't meant that they can do their job effectively. Mm. because of the fear of covid yeah so yeah join the union fabulous um and uh Rihanna and julie final quick word 
Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, go on. Go on, no, go on, it's okay. Uh, I, I was just going to, to say, um, it's been great to have so many participants that have lasted with us for this past hour. So thank you to the participants. I would just like to finally say, uh, Rihanna, who's done you know, a huge amount of work on this, is um, going on to comment with the uh, Welsh Government uh, straight after Christmas. Um, uh, only for a short time, I hope. Um, so we, we will all miss you, Re. And, um, you know, thank you for putting such a great uh, effort into this really important um, toolkit. So I'd just like to thank you from everybody, really, and wish you all the best at Welsh Government. They're very lucky to have you. Thank so, you very uh, much. She's, she's definitely coming back. That's true. Yeah. She's really <laughs> back. <laughs> I just say thank you very much that's really lovely and I'm really touched thank you well thank you um thank you everyone for joining us thank you to all our speakers thank you to the captioner um do please fill in our feedback form and please take a look at the new toolkit uh, the links have all been posted up in the chat box and um all that's left uh, for me is to say uh, look after yourselves if you are and look after each other, do please try and follow the rules. You know, it, it is a really serious situation out there um, at this moment in time, and there is a, a lot of pressure um, on frontline and key workers who essentially have no choice but to go to work. So, so we, as people, um, those of us who are able to work from home and have those kinds of flexibilities, you know, we do need to take into account what's happening out there and some of the pressure, the very real pressure on our um, on our NHS and, and social care services at this moment in time. So, so look after each other, and um, yes, if you're not a member of a union definitely join one there's never been a more important time to join the trade union than now so um yeah give that one little christmas present to yourselves if you haven't already done so so thank you very much and we shall see you all soon <laughs>